I will explore some of the hottest business and economic topics. The thing is, at least it's in the Philippines, but because there's always going to be a conflict at some point between commercial considerations and social considerations. Well, how does the crop insurance extend to the credit as well? Whenever a bank lends to either rice or corn, by law, that loan must be covered by crop insurance. Good evening and welcome to Eye on Business. I'm Ben Kritz and we're coming to you in you know, an environment of some unusual situations with the news, which we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But uh, what I want to talk about today, if I can share a little personal insight, as you may know, our offices here at the Manila Times are in Intramuros which is the oldest part of Manila and as a student of history I have always been uh, quite enthusiastic about working in this neighborhood. Over the past several years, I've been coming back and forth here to the office for about seven years now, over the past several years there have been some remarkable developments here in Intramuros. Uh, the place has changed a lot from what it looked like back in 2013 when I first started coming here and we can attribute that to the activity of the Intramuros administration. Now, some people in this country may not even be aware that there is such a thing as the Intramuros administration, and if they are, they may not know what it does here. So, in order to answer those questions and uh, talk a little bit about what there is to see and do in this really interesting part of town, I have with me to this evening the Intramuros administrator, attorney Gear Acido. Welcome, sir. And I understand uh, prior to joining the IA in 2017, you were with TIEZA, the Tourism Infrastructure and uh, Enterprise Zone yes. Authority. Yes. Yeah. Good okay. Evening, ben. Yes. Hi. I was I was uh, with TIEZA before. Well. Okay. So you're pretty familiar with you know working in that kind of business, which is yes. what you need to do here. Yes. Why don't you tell us what the Intramuros administration is and you know, what, what, uh, what you do here? Okay. Um, the Intramuros administration is a 40-year-old national government agency. So it was established 40 years ago. And its main mandate is basically to ensure the orderly restoration and development of Intramuros. Okay. Now, uh, that is in a way a recognition of the unique uh, characteristic of uh, Intramuros mm -hmm. as a uh, heritage and cultural site. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, the, we have here inside a, a World Heritage Site as well, recognized by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, of course, it gives significance also to the historical aspect of the place. Okay. Um, now, you're a, an attached agency mm -hmm. of the Department of Tourism. Correct? Yes, we are. Um, what's the relationship of the Intramuros administration with the city of Manila? Well, um, the city of Manila, um, the mayor of the city of Manila is a member of our board of administrators. We are basically like a, uh, a government corporation in a way, mm -hmm. but we don't have that corporate character. Um, we have our board of administrators to whom I report to. So that's headed by the Secretary of Tourism and Chairperson. And then we have the Mayor of the City of Manila. Then you have at, uh, other members of the board as well. You have the Secretary of Finance. You have the Secretary of uh, NEDA. Then you have the Dep Department of Public Works and Highways. Mm -hmm. Then we have the two government agencies also attached to the Department of Tourism which is TESA and uh, the Tourism Promotions Board. Okay. Now, going back 40 years ago, let's see, that would have made it around 1980. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of shape was Intramuros in when, <laughs> when this first started? Um, it's got, I, I think I know the answer <laughs> yes. to that, but describe that for, for um, people. I was able to talk to then the first administrator of uh, IA, then Minister uh, Jaime Laya. Mm -hmm. He was the Secretary of Budget, uh, the Minister of Budget, then he was also the BSP Governor at that mm -hmm. time. That's right. And he described to me the reason why there was a need to create the Intramuros Administration. At that time, the Palacio del Gobernador building, which ironically where we are located right now, was being constructed. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they, he already saw 
that there was a need for an agency or a unit in government that will ensure the restoration and development. Because in Palacio del Gobernador, as you can see now, uh, is way above right. the uh, limitations or overshadows in a way mm -hmm. the Manila Cathedral. So at that time, he said that he feared that if there will be no orderly uh, redevelopment of the district, then you have, will have a number of uh, high-rise towers or uh, there will be a number of uh, for informal settlers as well inside mm -hmm. the district. So trying to preserve a little historical integrity because yes. th th this part of town is, I mean, this is the original city of Manila and how old is, is you know, how old is the city? Um, uh, if the city dates, dates of Manila about. is around 450 years old by mm -hmm. next year, then actually Intramuros predates right. the city of Manila because when the Spanish, uh, Spanish came, came here, there was already civilization in a way. Mm -hmm. Yet this was already the, uh, the fortress and the kingdom of Ra Suleiman and Rahamatanda as well. So there was already civilization prior to the arrival mm -hmm. of the Spanish. Yes. Um, yeah, one, one thing I think most people don't realize too is when they come by here and they see the walls and mm -hmm. everything, most of that had to be, had to be rebuilt. Yes. Uh, I mean, this, this entire district was yes. comprehensively destroyed in the, the Battle of Manila. Correct. Um, you know, so that it was, was a, a yes, great effort to put everything back together so yes. that it looks somewhat original. Um, you mentioned uh, the development in Intramuros, and I had heard that before, mm -hmm. that that was one of the reasons why you know, they decided they need a dedicated agency to, yes. to overlook things, is they just didn't want things being built all willy-nilly, you know, not fitting in with the, um, fitting in with the neighborhood, mm -hmm. which brings me to another point um, that's, you know, pretty obvious to us right here in this location, mm -hmm. um, the new bridge that yes. they're building across to the Benando mm -hmm. side. Um, what was the process of vetting that so that mm -hmm. that didn't really, you know, clash with, uh, with, with, with what we've built mm -hmm. up in here so far? Well, there was a lot of debate, and until mm -hmm. now there is still a lot of debate about it. But what we basically required from the Department of Public Works and Highways is that they redesign the bridge. So, in a way, it will not be too intrusive mm -hmm. to the district of Intramuros. So it had to go through a process of redesign. Then um, there was also a discussion of before they can actually complete the land side, they had to submit to the National Commission on Culture and Arts a heritage impact assessment study. Then they were also required by the uh, National Museum to submit a um, archeological impact assessment study. Mm -hmm. So the heritage impact assessment study is still ongoing, but uh, the archaeological uh, has been submitted to the NCC as well. And just out of curiosity, have they discovered anything in the course of doing the work over there? Because um, I know that that uh, sometimes yes. ha that sometimes happens as they yes. start doing excavating and things. They'll uh -huh. they'll find some some mm -hmm. ancient things. Uh, I was just curious if anything has turned up. Um, there were some old charts of jars and uh, some. Uh, but nothing of significant uh, value anymore. Because that side of uh, Intramuros has already been the subject of archeological excavations during the time when the Maestrata walls were being reconstructed. Mm -hmm. So it was just a matter of redocumenting what has already been done as well. I see, okay. Um, now, if you can, in Briefly, what, what is the overall mm -hmm. development plan for, for Intramuros? Mm -hmm. um, you know, apart from restoring what can be restored, mm -hmm. um, maybe reconstructing some things. Uh, how does, you know, the, the, um, one thing that people don't realize, this is a very busy neighborhood. Yes. And there's a lot of businesses in here. We're here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of schools. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are people who live here. Yes. And then 
you know, there are the historical sites. So mm -hmm. how do you make all of that work together? Well, we came in basically, we recognized the fact that uh, Intramuros is a living community. Mm -hmm. So as you've said, there are people who are living here, studying here, and are working here. So that has to be the first point of recognition that we really have to make it a point to recognize the uh, value right now of the place. But aside from that, we said that we do not want any more uh, development plans in a way. Mm -hmm. What we want basically is to identify first the conservation management plan. We've done the conservation man management plan. And the next step right now is that we're identifying policies and then action points that will ensure the orderly uh, redevelopment of Intramuros. So it's not just a matter of coming out with another plan, mm -hmm. which has been done several times already in the right. past, but you cannot enforce them because it runs contrary to certain rules and regulations which are already existing. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we adopt UNESCO's Urban Heritage and Landscape Approach. And by adopting that as our international framework, we went on to the matter preparing already the first conservation management plan of Intramuros. It, in a way, uh, the value of the document is that it's a management tool as well. Mm -hmm. And it identified the universal significance of uh, the district. Um, our board of administrators just last week approved already the uh, conservation management plan. Okay, so we are great. now in the process of uh, executing certain aspects of the plan and uh, the long term is that by earlier than December uh, we will be able to submit this to UNESCO uh, Geneva I which see. was a requirement requested of us. I see, okay. Let's take a short break. Mm And we're back with the Intramuros Administration uh, Attorney Gear Acido. Um, now, in the past couple of years, as I've seen, there have been a lot of a lot of attractions mm -hmm. that have been finished up and, and open to the public. Why don't you tell us about some of those and maybe some that are going to be be uh, available to the public soon? Mm -hmm. Because that's really that's really a neat aspect of mm -hmm. of this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, one um, important matter is that uh, we've tried to implement projects already that were, in a way, identified or set even 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we had the uh, Museo de Intramuros, which ideally before was to house the collections of the Intramuros administration. Right. That was a 40-year project. Mm -hmm. It started, was started, and it was a dream started by then uh, uh, the first administrator. So I've, I've seen that collection when yes. it was when it was warehoused. Um, yes. Your predecessor, <laughs> um, well, actually, yeah, uh, it was Attorney Saldillo yes. showed it to Marco. me. Um, yes. It was really I, I'm, I'm so happy mm -hmm. that they've you know that, that, that they've you know started to roll that out to the public because there's yes. some in, incredible mm -hmm. pieces in there that were just in a couple of rooms up in your mm -hmm. office. Correct. So we have moved them out. We've opened the Museo de Intramuros. Um, it's now open. It's located in the old San Ignacio Church mm -hmm. of Intramuros, where the first Ateneo was. So what we decided was also not just to physically transfer the objects, but what we decided also is to curate them properly. Mm -hmm. So they're supposed to be ecclesiastical art. Right. Most of them are ecclesiastical right. art. But we decided that it should be a reflection of the Filipino's craftsmanship. That's why when we were discussing with the curators, how should we present the objects themselves? Mm -hmm. So we created a narrative that basically says that uh, these objects is, are reflections of the Filipino's identity, 
they're also a reflection of the Filipinos' uh, craftsmanship. So while they may be ecclesiastical or religious objects in a way, mm -hmm. they re reflect the Filipinos' identity. Mm -hmm. So you will see there, for example, uh, what the, the title of the uh, two uh, objects was uh, angels. But if you look at them, they were crafted without wings. So they were crafted in a, in like the way that our uh, uh, Ifugaos now craft their uh, sculptures. I see. And then you have objects there that have uh, chinky eyes. Or, so it's a reflection right, also. Right. I, 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 I remember that being pointed out to me too. That, yes. You know, um, and there are some also objects where you will see unique uh, elements that are distinctly Filipino. So, for mm -hmm. example, instead of uh, fruits that are not available here, you see there are pineapples or any other object that would be reflective of the Filipino. I see. So, in fact, the title of the exhibit, which is the or the title or the main curative handle of the museum, is the Indio response to evangelization. I see. Okay. So we've opened that already and it's still open for free to the public mm -hmm. they can visit from uh, uh, Wednesday to Sunday what we also did is to complete the revitalization of Fort Santiago right and while we have physically rehabilitated the space we also opened it at night already oh okay so um, I wasn't aware it's of now that. open until 11 so in a way it we were able to reintroduce it as another tourist product. Mm -hmm. So, until now, uh, even yesterday, uh, amidst all of the scares and the public declarations, we had around 15,000 people visiting wow, the fort. That many. Yes, from that's from eight until in the morning until 11 at night. Mm -hmm. So, we've also recovered most of the plazas already. So before the plazas or the public spaces were dimly lighted or, mm -hmm. or either mm -hmm. dimly lighted or totally dark. Right. So we placed some mm -hmm. lights. Some of them were covered with vendors too. Yeah. Uh, so we moved the vendors to a proper zone, mm -hmm. a proper area, and recovered the plazas as well. So now people are enjoying plazas and then uh, certain public spaces at night as well. Mm -hmm. In a way, we've addressed also the matter of uh, a concern always being raised to us that Intramuros is inaccessible, Intramuros uh, is hot <laughs> or humid every day yeah, or in the well, morning and the afternoon. That's hard to control. <laughs> uh. So now we've seen people uh, going around mm -hmm. by themselves, doing tours at night also. And in the next few days, we will be opening up museums also at night. I see. So it's in a way reintroducing the district to another uh, audience who will be able to come and visit mm -hmm. Intramuros. And and you've got the uh, you've got the the e trikes yes. and you know some better transportation for the yes. people to move around. Yes. Although it is a great district to walk around in. Mm -hmm. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it makes an, makes for a nice day trip yes. uh, if you want to come over here. Uh, and the dungeons are open. Yes, the dungeons are now Fort open Santiago. in Fort Santiago. They were open before, mm -hmm. but they were not accessible at night. So now it's accessible at night also. Uh, we, place, we place some lighting uh, mechanisms inside. Then we had you will see be able to see some uh, photographs as well of what it used to look like before. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it created also awareness and understanding of the value of the space. That it's not just a fort, but it actually served as a military jail yeah. as well. From Spanish period until the Japanese period. And uh, it's a good way to, uh, if you have a kid that doesn't want to behave, show him, <laughs> show him the dungeon. Uh, he'll straighten up because it's a little bit of a creepy place. I'm sure you've heard the ghost stories from from this neighborhood here. Yes, I've um, we've heard. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, um, what uh, what's on the horizon uh, as far as 
other things that mm -hmm. need to be restored in ongoing projects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I know there are, are a lot yes, of, there of are. things to, to yes. work on here. There are still a lot on our plate. For example, the main goal right now is to pedestrianize the streets. Mm -hmm. So there, we have identified portions of Intramuros that will be uh, for pedestrians only. I see. We've done that several times for the past two years and public acceptance was very high. So we want basically Intramuros to be a pedestrianized space mm -hmm. for people to walk around and for people to appreciate more. The other projects are more of infrastructure like uh, restoration of some uh, restoration of the plazas, the monuments, then uh, the real landscaping. But other than that, what we intend to do right now is to implement the conservation management plan. Mm -hmm. And in the CMP, there, co there is a matter of uh, reinforcing conservation of the uh, universal significance of the district. Mm -hmm. And according to the CMP, the universal significance lies on the urban grid design of Intramuros and its resiliency for the past uh, hundreds of years. If you look mm, at yes. it, the urban grid or the design of the streetscape is still relatively the same mm -hmm. as it was before during the Spanish period. So that, that in a way, establishes the resiliency of uh, the district as well. I see. Um, now, this year is the... 75th anniversary of yes. the Battle of Manila. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell us a little bit about how that's being commemorated. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I have a comment about that since mm -hmm. I, I have a degree in American history. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, it's, uh, um, it's a little bit unusual that that is not that is not as well known Correct. as I think it should be. And yes. I mean, that was an incredible moment in history yes. you know, for this city and in the entire World War II. Um, but it, it happened right here, folks, and mm -hmm. you, I know you're doing some special things for that for the 75th anniversary. Yes. Well, um, our interest basically in retelling the story of the 75th mm -hmm. year of the Battle of Manila started last year. Mm -hmm. um, we were fortunate enough to have heard the lecture of uh, James Scott. James Scott is a known uh, author he authored the first, and ironically, the first uh, U.S. book on the Battle of Manila. Mm -hmm. So he was basically able to narrate uh, the story coming from the American side and the Filipino side and what happened during the Battle of Manila. Mm -hmm. So after reading that, we decided that this is particular chapter in our history that should really be told. Mm -hmm. So we started already... Uh, last month the retelling the Battle of Manila story. But when we did the commemoration, we said that this should not just be a one day or a one month programming. Right. So we stretched it even up to September of uh, this year. So um, retelling the story means you have to identify ways of doing so. So we partnered, for example, with the U.S. Embassy. Mm -hmm. um, there's an ongoing exhibit right now in the American barracks of Port Santiago. For the first time, there are photographs coming from the National Archives of the United States. Never before seen photographs of the from the National Archives of the Second World War and particularly of the Battle of Manila. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main narrative is that uh, the Philippines and the United States were allies during this particular period. So we also partnered with the World War II Memorial Foundation and Memorare Manila Foundation to again uh, retell, re, uh, retell the story. These are two private organizations with uh, whose, whose membership basically are coming from families were victims of the Second World War, particularly of the Battle of Manila. Mm -hmm. So they have a personal stake in all of this. So we decided to partner with them, tell it also from that perspective. So we had a com uh, uh, 75th year commemoration activity in the Memorare Manila uh, site, the monument, 
then we said that this really should be uh, retold more. So uh, we've been encouraging people to not just visit the exhibit. There's also a strong collaboration right now with the World War II Memorial Foundation in doing some uh, videos and some private tours of the sites where in Intramuros of uh, significance to the Second World War. Okay, let's take another short break. Mga isyong pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyon dapat yung malaman, tatalakayin, pupusisiin, at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panahugin sa harap ng bayan. Face Off! Okay, and we're back uh, discussing developments in Intramuros and hopefully encouraging uh, some of your people to come and visit. Uh, I'm a little bit spoiled. I get to come here every day and uh, with my interest in history, uh, there's always something new to see even though I've been here every day for almost seven years. Um, one of the well there's a couple of there's a couple of things i'd like to ask you about since we do work in this neighborhood there is quite a bit of business that goes on here apart from the tourism mm -hmm. um how um how are you okay you you've described you're working on the conservation plan first so i can imagine that takes priority but you know um people still need to move around yes. in intramuros and one of the stickiest problems which i'm sure that you've mm -hmm. probably heard an awful lot about is where do you park parking um <laughs> yes. yeah you know, how um what what are you working on with uh you know like road infrastructure yes. since that's the um you know, well, it's kind of uh, the sticky for part for the past several years uh, we've, since we've started two years more than two years ago is to rehabilitate the street network Mm -hmm. so that we were able to uh, rehabilitate already 10 national and local roads inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, the DPWH has also rehabilitated, uh, for example, the major streets in Arsobispo and Santa Lucia Street. Out, immediately outside of the walls as well, uh, the Department of Public Works rehabilitated the main line uh, or the pedestrian side of uh, Bonifacio to Burgos streets mm -hmm. and that stretches around three kilometers mm -hmm. and it has now as a bike lane and a pedestrian path and a revitalized landscaping and land lighting as well. So the main objective basically is for ensuring not just access but mobility mm -hmm. and when we speak of the traffic and the mobility inside well, we recognize the fact that we cannot do this alone we had to work with the stakeholders that right. means we had to work with the local government unit then down to the level of the barangays and enforcing traffic laws rules and regulations but in identifying the traffic mobility plan we had to do consultations also with the stakeholders mm -hmm. for them to identify the proper uh, zones uh, in terms of parking we do recognize that as a concern. So what we did basically is to identify certain idle or abandoned uh, space, public, uh, private and public spaces, which were now turned into parking spaces. Mm -hmm. But eventually what we would like to see is a situation where people will have to walk around. If right. you're going to Intramuros, uh, we've noticed that the main cause of the traffic here our pass is passed through traffic. Yes, that, that's what it seems like to me, yes. too. I mean, we still get a lot of traffic from the mm -hmm. port, yes. uh, for not instance. Just, not just from the port, but also private vehicles mm -hmm. that are using basically the inside streets as access points. So what we are now going to do is to, in a way, shift the traffic mm -hmm. for people to regain again the street as their pedestrian space. Mm -hmm. Um, and another, uh, this has been, this has been a, uh, 
something that's been brought up by visitors here, but um, there is a there is a fairly sizable permanent population mm -hmm. in in Intramuros, and a, many of them are, you know, if they were outside the walls, yes. would be considered informal settlers, yes. um, even though most uh, I, I think. Most people don't realize these co little communities have been there an awful yes. long time. Um, what kind of um, what what kind of ideas are being discussed mm -hmm. as far as housing? Yes. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of you know, for for lack of a kinder term, cleaning up mm -hmm. you know some of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Well, what we did basically is to identify first where they are located, mm -hmm. what kind of lands are they occupying or possessing. So we were able to establish the fact that the remaining informal settlers right now are located actually not in public lands, but in private lands. Mm, okay. So we had to deal it differently given certain limitations or restrictions since it's private land. Right. So what we did is to adopt a socialized housing approach. And, and based on that approach, we, are, we have executed an agreement with some of the property owners where they agreed to enroll the, pro the property or the problem to us. And that means giving us the situation or of addressing it. So we have implemented this, started implementation. In fact, the first 107 families that will be moving or relocating to a new site have been, has been set in motion. Mm -hmm. So we are doing this along with uh, a national government housing agency which is the Socialized Housing Finance Corporation. Okay. So there was budget made available several years before, but due to transition and due to some management uh, matters, that was never fully implemented. I see. So we revived the program. We decided that we can do this, but we have to do this with a proper agency, mm -hmm. and that's the Socialized Housing Finance Corporation. So right now, with the implementation of the program, we've identified that the first phase of the 107 families, um, they have identified a new site. They are now in the process of preparing the documents for them to move out. We are also now in the stage of doing it for the other communities. Mm -hmm. All in all, what we're hoping to address uh, with this program is addressing the needs of 500 uh, families for a formal housing program. I see. Now, are are they going to? Um, you you're said relocating them. Are yes. they still going to be within within uh, it, the area, or, or, or are they moving yes, moving they're out? They're moving out. Unfortunately, well, the situation is that since it's private property, mm -hmm. um, the property owner still has uh, that right to develop it. Right. But with us coming in to address their problem and with us expediting the resolution of their problem, we said that you should do the development based on what we see should be the proper uh, development in that space. I see. So, so there's a give and take yes, there. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's actually an, a, an engagement mm -hmm. where we see um the private uh, owner agreeing and then also the informal settlers themselves agreeing to be part of the program i see um now that doesn't that uh do, doesn't that maybe create a little bit of a pinch because we have so many new businesses mm -hmm. coming in here i've seen new restaurants and yes. and, and and uh different little different little places i mean this is a it's perfect. There's mm -hmm. a on-site workforce. Mm -hmm. um, you well, know, uh, if, yeah. if they, you know, if you don't move them, yes. move them all. But what we told the community as well is that we're not, in a way, depriving you of uh, your willingness to still work here. For example, if your work here uh, is still, you want still to work here, then you can do so, provided that it be a resident of another place. So there's that recognition already that uh, among the informal communities that, uh, as you said, they've been staying here for the longest time, actually. 
you have here informal settlers who have been here for more than 40 years, but nothing has been uh, given to them as a proposal for addressing their situation. So now they're welcoming this opportunity because they see that uh, there is now seriousness on our part to address the problem. Okay, let's take one more quick break. The Philippines has been around for centuries. Malayo na rin ang narating natin. But back then, the way of life has been mostly analog. Did you know that you need to take a boat from Cavite in order to go to Manila? Yes, ganon ang takbo ng buhay dati. You need to send a letter to the United States? Sure, pero aabutin ka ng isang buwan bago matanggap ang iyong liham. Kailangan mong tumawag sa bahay o sa iyong kaibigan? Many ways to do that. Pwede ka maghulog ng tatlong 25 sa payphone or use that vintage rotary phone na most likely 6 digits lang ang landline number. Forget about email. Telex at fax machine ang modes of communication for business. You want to listen to that one song of your favorite band on repeat? Sorry, pero kailangan mong i-rewind ang cassette tape. Buong album naman ang kailangan mong bilhin kahit iisang kanta lang ang gusto mo doon. But things change and we as a race progress. The world is getting small. We are now a traveling population. Why? Because travel is now cheap. Our friends are across the world because our form of communication is now borderless. Time zones are now meant to serve as a guide and not as a limitation. We can buy things from the comfort of our homes. Nasanay na tayo sa convenience because why not? It is the price of development and the glimpse of our future. Have you imagined the future? How do you think it will look like? Driverless cars? Yes, autonomous driving will happen. Robots replacing low-value processes done by humans? Tama ka dyan. Paying for your groceries using digital currency? Very realistic. Materials being 3D printed instead of ordering? Yes, we are indeed a progressive race. And technology plays a vital and crucial part of it. How will this affect our lives? Kailangan ba natin itong matutunan? Mahirap ba itong aralin? Or kaya naman? How can our nation take advantage of these advancements? All of these can be understood and learned. Tayo ng matuto para umunlad. Nandito na ang Abante. Progress through technology. And we're back with Intramuros Administrator Guillermo Cido. Um, now we were talking about the the, the settlers um, that you, you're mm -hmm. moving some people around and and you know maybe giving them a little bit better situation and also mm -hmm. making a better situation here. Um, are there? Are, uh, now I know some of this is up to private landowners, but are there? plans uh, that you know of to develop um, like regular housing in here um, inside yeah yes, um, does that fit in with the with the conservation plan um, it, yes because there's a lot of students that live in here yes. but I'll tell you I mean just as a personal note mm -hmm. I a few months ago I was looking for an apartment because mm -hmm. I'd lived some distance away and I would have loved to have found a place mm -hmm. in here um, mm -hmm. You know, it's this yes. would be this is, this would be pretty a uh, pretty profitable area as yeah. far as that goes. Well, we, I've spoken to lot uh, many of the property owners. Mm -hmm. There's that strong interest, especially uh, they've since they've been seeing a revitalized uh, district. Right. To really, uh, for example, set up hotels or accommodations. Right. Yeah. That's the uh, other thing is yes, hotels. Yes. There's not much. There are right only in here. two hotels here. Right. But you will see that there are a lot of dormitories. Mm -hmm because of the student population. Mm -hmm. But we also would like to see, um, hopefully in before we leave uh, the administration, more in sec uh, accommodation establishments, more reasons or more places where you can actually stay, mm -hmm. even for a long term. Yeah, that would, that would, that yes. would be nice. Um, uh, 
You mentioned uh, the number of visitors at Fort Santiago, and I'm just curious. Um, have, are you been you've been tracking tourist visitors? Um, yeah, you know, how many people have uh, have we been seeing coming to yeah. to visit? Well, um, it's actually one of our performance indicators mm -hmm. to establish the number of visitors coming to the district. So, um, ever since we came in in 2017. What we're seeing is a progressive increase of uh, visitors, mm -hmm. and that's because of the number of programs that we are actually implementing as well. So, what we are seeing right now in terms of the number of people going into Fort Santiago did not happen overnight. This right. actually was the result of uh, several months and even a year of uh, planning and programming and rehabilitation work. So, before last year. Uh, if you're looking at numbers, the number of people who are actually visiting Fort Santiago was only around 400, 500, the most, mm -hmm. except when we do open houses, when we say Fort Santiago is for free. Mm -hmm. So that runs around to 4,000 or to 5,000 5, people at the most. And last year, uh, because of the number of programs, we were able to reach around 3.7 million people. Oh. But now, ever since we started uh, within, uh, in January, we're seeing an increase in numbers. Like uh, the average right now is around on a weekday. That mean from Monday to Friday is around five, more than 5,000. And it week, sun, and on Saturdays and Sundays, it doubles. But mm. last, the, yesterday, when we celebrated the uh, International Women's Day mm -hmm. and allowed free entrance to all walk-in female uh, visitors, we had more than 15,000 people. I see. Yeah, well, yeah. that's usually when I bring my kids is when it's free. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, now, let's just talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the big elephant in the room mm -hmm. right now. Um, we have the COVID-19 outbreak, which yes. is shaking everybody up. Um, has that has that yet, well, two questions, has that yet affected, you know, the number of visitors that we're seeing here? Um, and are there any uh, special precautions yes. or, 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 you know, procedures that you're, you mm -hmm. know, either following or planning to implement to, well, to protect um, people yeah. here? Ever since the news on the virus came out, mm -hmm. what we did is basically to encourage uh, precaution in terms of uh, going inside the spaces that we manage. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to Fort Santiago and the other spaces, you will see their uh, signs as well on what should be the proper hygiene and uh, cough etiquette. And we also uh, place there uh, in the entrances, uh, alcohol uh, dispensers, mm -hmm. not just in the entrances, but in all the toilets as well, with that we are public in a way. Um, to us, in, for the past few days and weeks, um, there has been relatively little effect mm -hmm. on the numbers. What we've seen actually is an increase in the numbers. I so see. what we are trying to reconcile is the fact that maybe perhaps because that we are an open public space mm -hmm. so people may see that or perceive that as a more safer ground that's true i hadn't thought of that yeah, yeah. so be, so in a way mm -hmm. it becomes an advantage to us as well, mm -hmm. well but um, we do recognize the value of uh, uh, ensuring that the visitors when they come in are safe mm -hmm. as well so we place the precautionary measures we've I placed proper notices and uh, just today we've sent out a number of letters to all the establishments inside mm -hmm. from museums to universities to restaurants uh, even to government offices to please follow the guidelines issued by the department of health to ensure safety uh, in the workplace or safety in the public areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, anything, uh, anything you would like to 
Anything you'd like to plug? Anything that's coming up that uh, mm -hmm. you, you want to uh, you know, let people be aware of? Um, well, um, thank you for this opportunity of, uh, giving, of giving us this opportunity to speak about Intramuros. Um, in the coming days, you will see more programmings that are basically uh, thematic mm -hmm. and more focused on the heritage and uh, historical value of the space. Uh, we are also doing a paradigm shift in terms of hours that we are open. Mm -hmm. So, for example, while we've extended the time of Fort Santiago up to 11 in the evening now, mm -hmm. uh, we're, ho we're going to do it in, in a similar fashion to the museums that we manage as well, and also the gardens. So you will see Casa Manila uh, Museum and then uh, Baluarte San Diego open until uh, uh, open at night until 11. I see. Okay, that's nice. It's nice here at night. Well, that's about all the time we have. Um, it, this is a neat neighborhood, people. It's it's uh, unique in most parts of the world to have a living neighborhood that's about 600 years old uh, and have so many attractions um, and more all the time. Uh, there's little improvements that go on constantly here. Uh, you should, if you're have been here before come back and see what's new if you haven't been here before you should pay a visit um, you know this is this is a nice place it's a nice place to work I can say that personally and um, it has been very interesting to watch over the years as things have developed uh, and it's good that in this country where heritage doesn't seem to be given the attention that it should be all the time this is one place where that is a wonderful exception I'd like to thank my guest, the Intramuros Administrator, uh, Attorney Gio Cito. Uh, thank you thank for you, coming man. on, Sarah, thank you. and uh, good luck to you, and thank you. keep up the good work. Thank you. And that's all the time we have. This has been Eye on Business, and I'm Ben Kretz. Good night. Thank you.